Cool, let's start then. Hello everyone, my name is Jose Alferreca. I'm a developer relations engineer at Google. And today I'm going to talk about data binding. This is an advanced talk, so you should probably be familiar with basic things like layout expressions, uh, provided and custom binding adapters, and observability. If you're not familiar with these concepts, it's probably fine, you'll learn something anyway. So, um, I have a bunch of topics to talk about in no particular order. This is an advanced talk, but it doesn't mean that they are hard to uh, implement or hard to understand. And uh, we're going to start with something super simple, which is how to define uh, binding adapters in Kotlin. So the most common way of doing this is um, defining a function in the top level of a Kotlin file. Um, data binding is going to look for static methods annotated with a binding adap adapter annotation. So this is exactly what a top level function is going to generate. Another way of doing this is by putting binding adapters inside an object, but you have to remember to add the JVM static annotation, otherwise it's not going to be a static method, it's just going to be an instance method. Um, the problem with this approach is that if you forget that annotation, then you're going to have a very bad time knowing what's wrong with the binding adapter. Don't ask me how I know that. Um, the, what the cool kids do nowadays is this, they use uh, extension functions. This is very cool because adding an extension function on the class means that the list of attributes in the, bind in the annotation is going to match the list of, um, of values in the method. So it's a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. Uh, and also when this compiles uh, to bytecode, the f instance of the view is going to be the first parameter, which is exactly what data binding expects. So it's a good coincidence. Now there's a fourth way of defining binding adapters, and it's using the data binding component. Uh, this is going to create dynamic binding adapters. So um, you might not be familiar with this, and it's because the API of data binding component is a bit limited, but I'm going to explain to you anyway. Yeah, it's scrubbed. It's fine. <laughs> it says class, not last, okay? So, um, so yeah, let's say you want to use a, uh, an object that is usually only available at runtime, like a fragment inside a binding adapter. Well, you can use this with the data binding component. So we create a class, and we put binding adapters inside this class. Uh, you don't need the JVM static annotation. This is actually going to be an instance method. And inside the binding adapter, you can have access to the fragment, because in this case, we're using Glide to load some images, et cetera, et cetera. So, you build this class, or you build the project with this class, and uh, data binding is going to generate this interface. It's going to have a getter per class that has binding adapters inside. So uh, we have to implement this interface and override this method called get fragment binding adapters. It's going to take the name from the class that we just generated. And in the getter, we just return an instance of the class that we just created. So great, we have two classes but we haven't really connected them to anything. We do that in the fragment or activity uh, in the um, inflation stage. So we get an instance of our fragment data binding component, and here's where we pass this. So we pass the fragment over there. And then you have two options, either pass the data binding component to the inflate method, or you can call set default component in data binding util. Um, as you can see, the API is quite limited. So there's only one data binding component per app. So you're not supposed to use this a lot. Um, it's really a last resort. So it's much better if you try to keep your binding adapters static. Now the cool thing about data binding component is that you can make the first class that we, that we uh, created, you can make it abstract and inject different versions of it. So for example, you can have um, a collection of binding adapters only for test that instead of using Glide, uh, for UI tests, uh, you load a uh, test resource directly into the image view so that you don't have to go to a network, etc. So it's much better. So you can read more about this or, or see an example of this in action in the GitHub browser sample that we have over the Android architecture components repo. So now, for something completely different, this is a feature that I really like of data binding, and it's about how to use data binding with includes. So let's say we want to create this screen. It has two player layouts. So normally, uh, instead of repeating code, you would use an include. You would include the user profile layout twice. 
So how do we convert this to data binding? We wrap it in the uh, layout tag, and we add a variable called users. It can be a list of, in this case, it's a pair of user. And then we assign users first and users second to the user attribute. So what is this? Is this coming from a binding adapter? How do you even create a binding adapter for the include class? Is, is that a class? Well, no, it's actually the variable of the child layout. So just by setting one variable, we can control three different layouts with, this, uh, with data binding, which is really, really cool. So two-way data binding. This is a very advanced topic, and it's completely optional. And the reason is that, um, is it corrupt? No, it's fine. The reason is that uh, you can do everything that two-way data binding does with one-way data binding. So in the checkbox on top, we have um, a layout expression in the check assigned to the checked attribute, and then the unchecked change is assigned to a lambda. So we're basically writing to the UI and reading from the UI. Is this two-way data binding? Well, no, it's just one-way data binding, but in two different directions. Two-way data binding is used in the second checkbox. So in the checked attribute, we, we're using a two-way data binding expression, and that's because the checked attribute is enabled for two-way data binding functionality. A two-way data binding expression looks something like this. It has an equal sign after the uh, at symbol. And what do we put on the other side uh, of a two-way data binding expression? One way of do a very simple way of doing it is uh, by using mutable live data. So we can set a value inside the view model to write to the UI, and we can use transformations to read uh, from the UI. If you want more flexibility, then you can use an observable class. Here I'm using an observable view model. This is a class that we have available in many samples, so just Google it if you need to make a view model observable. Uh, it implements the observable interface. And you create observable properties by annotating a getter with a bindable annotation. Doing this is going to generate an uh, observable property called remember me. So in the getter, we just return whatever we want. We can compute a new value, or we can return a uh, backing property like this. And in the setter, we're going to receive a new value. It's going to be a Boolean, because we're talking about a checkbox. And then the first thing you have to do is avoid infinite loops. Um, this is a problem with two-way data binding. If you don't, this, if you don't do this, uh, the setter is going to uh, basically call the getter, tell data binding that something changed, then the getter is going to update the UI, and then the setter is going to be called, etc. So you have to break that loop somehow. You do it like this. Uh, so if the value hasn't changed, we don't do anything. After that, we assign a new value to the backing property, and then we have to call notify property change. This is how we tell data binding that something actually changed. Uh, data binding is going to call the getter, get the new value, and then update the UI. After that, you can save data, whatever, save it on shared preferences, whatever you need to do. Uh, save data would be a private method in this view model. It's not part of the library. So what if you want to implement your own two-way data binding functionality? Let's say you have a my color picker um, view, custom view, and you want to enable uh, two-way functionality in the color attribute. Well, it's actually quite complicated but we have a sample in the Android data binding repo. Um, uh, it's called two-way data binding sample, and, it's, and the readme is super comprehensive. It explains everything very well, so just look for the complex two-way case. It also has a simple two-way case um, and one-way uh, data binding as well. So when we released um, data binding, we released a collection of classes called the observable fields. But two years later, we released Live Data and Architecture Components. And uh, Live Data is a lifecycle aware observable. It also has some advantages. Uh, it supports transformations, so you can make some Live Data depend on other Live Data. And also, uh, other libraries and uh, Architecture Components like Work Manager and Room, they already support Live Data. So it's a good idea, or my recommendation is that you migrate uh, from observable fields to Live Data if you're using observable fields. It's very simple. You only need two steps. The first one, it's, uh, you convert the actual observable field to live data. So if you have a variable, a layout variable, um, an observable field of something, then you um, convert it to live data of something. That's very straightforward. 
if you're exposing an observable field from a view model, uh, this is another advantage of live data, the fact that it has a mutable and an immutable version. So you can use um, a mutable live data as a backing property and only expose the mutable version of it so that no one can change the value of your live data outside the view model. And the second step is that you have to remember to set the lifecycle owner. Data binding is not going to know which lifecycle owner you want to use with your uh, live data, and this is very, very simple. It's only one, uh, one line of code. If you're using an activity, you have to pass this to the uh, lifecycle owner, so you pass the activity. But if you're using a fragment, you have to use the view lifecycle owner, because fragments have two different life cycles because fragments can be in a detached state and, well, fragments, right? So use view lifecycle owner whenever you use fragments. You can read more about this in our Android developers publication over at Medium. So now, my favorite topic here is fast binding testing. This is uh, actually very, very cool. Can we test data binding expressions? And the answer to this is, yeah, sure. You can just start an emulator, fire up an activity, and use a UI testing framework to navigate around until you have some coverage of those expressions. But this is quite slow. So the real question is, can we unit test data binding expressions? And the answer is kind of. We need an emulator, so it's not going to be a pure unit test. Uh, but we won't need to start an activity, and we won't need Espresso to navigate around. So let's see how we do it with an example. In here, we have a form, an email, a password, it has a checkbox with the read terms of service label, you know, the one that you check after reading carefully the, re the terms of service, and then a button. And we want to make the button only enabled when the checkbox is checked. How do we do this? Do we use a view model and then a listener on the checkbox and then tell the button to be no need? Actually, this is a very cool feature of data binding. You can reference all the views directly by their ID and you can use their attributes directly. So how do we unit test this? We don't even have a view model to unit test. Well, the test is going to be very simple. As I said before, it has to run on an emulator or device, so you need the Android unit for runner. Um, you need to run it on the UI thread, so that's why we have that annotation. The subject under test is going to be the actual binding object. The first thing you have to do once you obtain the binding is execute pending bindings. This is going to bring this object to a ready state. And after that, you can start doing assertions if you want. This is not necessary, of course, but uh, we're just going to make sure that the sign up button is initially uh, disabled. And then we can start making changes. So we check the button by changing the is checked property. Now, this is not going to do anything, uh, it's just reassigning a, a variable. So you have to call execute pending bindings again to recompute all the uh, layout expressions that depend on the is checked attribute that we just changed, and then we can verify that the sign up button is now enabled. So pretty cool and super fast. It's like at least 10 times faster than an espresso test, even though it's not a pure unit test. So now let's talk about this very specific case, and it's about splitting state. Let me explain. So normally, uh, you would have something like this. In your view model, you're exposing different buckets of state. So in here we have name, number of followers, etc. What happens when the number of followers change um, or changes? Well, only a subset of UI calls and binding adapters are going to be uh, called or used because data bind that's the whole point of data binding. You don't have to refresh your whole UI. It's going to be smart enough to know what changed. Now, the problem is that in some modern approaches to architecture, um, for example, uh, Mavericks, uh, the framework, um, they use a single immutable object to hold the whole state of, the, of your UI. The problem is that that doesn't really work very well with data binding, because if something changes in the state, the whole UI is going to be refreshed. So how do we work around this? Instead of assigning that live data directly to a layout variable, you might think you could do something like this. So you split the state into four different variables. And then in your fragment, you have, sorry, <laughs> I moved a slide. 
you have to take into account that expressions are reevaluated on bind. So this means every time you reset the value of a layout variable, all the layout expressions related to that variable are going to be reevaluated. So you can't really do something like this. In a fragment, we have an on state changed uh, somehow. Um, and if we assign each piece of state to a variable, then the whole UI is going to be refreshed, which is not what we want. So you could do checks here. So only rebind when the, um, the value has actually changed. Or you can do something a bit more elegant using live data. Because we're exposing live data from the view model, we can use live data in the layout. And we can map view model state to each of the buckets. And then on that live data, we call distinct until changed. Distinct until changed is an um, extension function that is only going to emit when the uh, value has changed. And this is available in lifecycle live data, but it's currently in alpha. But it's just an extension function. So if you're not comfortable with alphas in your project, just copy and paste it. But don't tell anyone I said that. So we're going to um, finish with something that is not an advanced tip at all. We're just going to talk about Android Studio. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, usage in the library. So the numbers are going up, not just uh, in uh, absolute numbers. Also, the percentage of apps in production are using or, or is increasing using uh, data binding. So that justifies things like having a dedicated um, a dedicated team working on data binding in Android Studio. So the problem is that data binding is very tightly coupled with, um, with tools, with Android Studio. So all the improvements are coming in the future. So these are some things already fixed in 3.4, but mostly in 3.5. So we have uh, typing latency has been fixed. Cryptic errors have been rewritten. So um, hopefully they are understandable now. Auto-completion uh, improved, new lint checks, refactoring has been improved as well. Code folding for the less than symbol, finally. It doesn't mean that uh, XML now is going to, um, uh, to support the less than symbol directly. It just, it's just going to show the less than symbol in Android Studio. Um, data binding is still going to be XML compliant. And the best thing ever is that the errors finally show up in the build output toolbar. They have their own category. And the actual error is going to show up in a window, which is amazing. If you know what I'm talking about, looking for a data binding error uh, used to be uh, an absolute pain. Um, I might actually use this view from now on, not the text. I'm sure you've all toggled to the um, text build out, uh, output instead of this graphical one. But this is uh, completely uh, amazing. So try Android Studio 3.5 if you want to see all these nice things. So some links for you. Um, we have the um, official documentation for data binding. It's uh, regularly maintained. The code lab, if you're not familiar with the, uh, with the, with the library, it's a good resource. It's quite basic, but um, it's good to pass around your colleagues if you want them to learn about data binding. Then we have the official samples in Android data binding. And we use the library in the Android architecture component samples, in some of them at least, in some branches of Android architecture blueprints, and in production apps like the Google I.O. app, the Android Dev Summit app, uh, Nick Butch's Plat, and uh, TV from Chris Baines. So if you have any questions, I'm going to be around in the conference, so feel free to stop and ask me. Thank you very much.